Thank you very much uh, for uh, coming out to tonight. Um, tonight's uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Ivan Pozachanko, our, uh, our two postdoctoral fellows at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And if you've seen the poster, I won't uh, read what's on it, you know it already. Uh, he's going to speak about uh, Kharkiv and the Russian Spring. And I'm very interested to find out what he means by the Russian Spring, whether it means Russia springing something on Ukraine and the rest of the world. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Kozachak. <coughs> Uh, this uh, presentation is based on my postdoctoral uh, research project, which is uh, the Ukraine crisis, contested identities, social media, and transnationalism. Uh, uh, it investigates the change in uh, nation building, uh, in Ukraine's nation building, after Euromaidan revolution and uh, after Russian spring, this mass pro-Russian uprisings in east and, and south of the country, and Russian aggression against Ukraine. Also, it looks at the role of social media uh, for social movements such as Euromaidan and uh, counter movement of uh, anti-Maidan. And Kharkiv represents is very peculiar case for several reasons. It was one of the uh, key cities for the Russian Spring and seen mass pro-Russian uprisings, but somehow it managed to stay under the control of uh, uh, Ukrainian authorities. And uh, uh, also, uh, it uh, remains in uh, Timothy Snyder's uh, language, edge of Europe. So behind lies uh, not Europe or against anti-Europe. So several words about Kharkiv. Some of you know, some of may not. It was founded in 1654 by Cossacks and initially was part of the Cossack uh, state hetmanate. It's, uh, in Kharkiv was established the uh, third university uh, in the Russian Empire and it significantly contributed to the development of the city over years. Also, Ukrainian nationalism uh, partly originates from Kharkiv. Here, Nikolai Ivanovich Kostomarov has written his fundamental book on two kinds of Russian people, thus providing the foundation for Ukrainian national idea. Kharkiv, unlike Kyiv, uh, generally supported Bolsheviks and was uh, taken by, without battles and was declared the capital of that time separatist Donetsk Krivorosh Republic. And then it was appointed as a, a or made the capital of the Soviet Ukraine. The idea of Kharkiv as the, the first capital still serves as one of the pillars of regional identity. Uh, in the early Soviet years, uh, it has seen the blossoming Ukrainian cultural revival under the uh, Koronizatsiya policies. However, however with uh, Stalin's swept to power, uh, most prominent representatives of the Ukrainian intelligentsia were executed. So this sh short period of uh, cultural revival is usually called executed Ukrainian Renaissance. Also, it's the uh, third most important industrial center in the Soviet Union, after Moscow and Leningrad, with many factories and, uh, and plants. It's also called the City of Students. It hosts 35 higher educational institutions and uh, around 300,000 students studying there. It is predominantly Russian-speaking, around 90% uh, according to different surveys speak Russian in the city. The situation is different for the region, where 54% are Ukrainian-speaking and 44% are Russian-speaking. My understanding of the processes taking place in Kharkiv uh, since Euromaidan relies on the following theories. Manuel Castells uh, argues that new digital media allowing network social movements to emerge. These are leaderless horizontal networks of solidarity. Moreover, digital media creates spaces of autonomy from the state of power, where these uh, social movements can operate freely. Also, I consider su such aspect as emotional attachment to a social movement. Craig Kalgun, in his study of Tiananmen Square uprisings in China, argues that people sacrifice themselves not uh, for abstract ideas of the democratization of China, but rather uh, due to super strong emotional attachment uh, they developed with other protesters. 
Somewhat more moderate idea expressed by Donatella Dole Porte, who argues that emotional attachment to a social movement is crucial for its overall success. Finally, I use the concept cultural trauma by P Peter, Peter Stomka. Uh, it results from the uh, cultural trauma results from the dramatic events such as war, collapse of empire, acts of terror. The collapse of the Soviet Union can be seen as such traumatizing event. Stomka argues that trauma is paralyzing rather than enabling authority and uh, usually results in low levels of trust and social cohesion. Resting on these theories, I address in my study the following research questions. Why did Kharkiv remain under control of the Ukrainian authorities? What was the role of social media during and after the Russian spring? And has the Euromaidan revolution of 2014 and the Russian spring reconfigured Kharkiv's identity? In order to answer these questions, I use the following research methods. First, qualitative content analysis of online groups on social media. For this study, I investigated anti-Maidan, Euromaidan general groups and their uh, Kharkiv uh, subgroups, as well as the biggest news group uh, for Kharkiv is Kharkiv Life. Uh, all investigation was done on uh, Vkontakte social uh, uh, media service. Also, I employed interviewing methods. Uh, first, I interviewed uh, experts. These are social scientists, journalists, local politicians and activists. But for many times, uh, the role of social scientists coincided with active uh, civic position. Also, I used biographical interviews to see how biographies of people fit this uh, social uh, movement. So I interviewed 10 uh, Euromaidan supporters and 10 anti-Maidan supporters. Also, I stayed in the city during all events and uh, I, I took part in the events, observed them and made diaries about this. So participant observation was uh, another method. And uh, the data collection was uh, done within a particular time frame from January 2014 to October 2015, basically to the date uh, when uh, the results of local ele elections were announced. Before turning to the events of the Russian Spring, I have to outline the main events of the Euromaidan Kharkiv. So it started even earlier than in Kyiv on 19th November 2013, with small protest encouraging Yanukovych to sign the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. On 24th of December, Kharkiv Euromaidan coordinator Dmitro Pelipets was stopped and wounded. Uh, he survived the attack. On 11th and 12th of January 2014, all Ukraine Forum of Euromaidan took place in Kharkiv. This event of particular importance as it illustrates the notion of horizontal networks, as the forum attracted not politicians, but representatives of local Maidans across from all Ukraine. During the forum, Titushkas or higher thugs were constantly attacking the delegates. On 26th of January, with the escalation in uh, Kiev, also a massive attack happened on Sunday Vichy by Titushkas. It actually was successfully repelled. And on 22nd uh, of February 2014, protests near the sports palace march and peaceful occupation of the regional uh, administration by Euro Euromaidan activists took place. So, uh, to explain the, to give the illustration of this event. So, this is how uh, Freedom Square looked like on the 1st December 2014. Karen has put uh, this cage, uh, this metal fence, to prevent people to come in to protest. Also, they announced that there is like immense and horrible uh, uh, flu pandemic. And uh, so, all, uh, all, uh, uh, all, uh, applications for protest were declined using these re reasons. And uh, <clears throat> so it's quite ironical to see Freedom Square like this. And the one of the other pretext was the establishment this, uh, of Christmas Fair, very similar to Yanukovych style. With uh, the escalation of uh, violence, uh, uh, there are numerous uh, groups of Titushkas who were sent from Kharkiv. And uh, they suspect that Hinadi Kernes was, uh, Kharkiv's mayor was behind 
of this. And uh, Kharkiv became famous also for Super Titushkas or Fight Club or Plot. So these are uh, responsible uh, for constant attacks on uh, Euromaidan, Kharkiv. The leader of a plot, Evgeny Zhilin, he's over here in the center left. Uh, he fled to Russia and uh, with the, uh, during the Russian spring, most of these people uh, moved uh, to Donetsk and the plot finally became a separ separatist military unit in Donetsk. <coughs> However, uh, with such immense pre uh, pressure, uh, social media was cru crucial for local Euromaidan. Uh, here is the citation from the interview with Euromaidan Kharkiv coordinator. Before the event in, uh, in, uh, on Hrushevsko, before they started killing people, it was tougher in Kharkiv than in any other place in Ukraine. Every three days they were setting on fire our cars. One of our activists was stabbed in December. People from Oplot, these Titushkas that uh, then went to Kyiv and all Ukraine learned about them. They were fighting with us all the time. They threatened us, burned our cars. All our phones were wired up. Despite this, we, ha we have accepted the challenge and organized forum of Euromaidans of January the 11th. During the forum, we were bl uh, blocked uh, e everywhere and it was not clear where we should go. But we could uh, choose a safe route using the updates people sent us via Facebook. Actually, close group on Facebook were the most secure way to communicate at that time. So it shows that uh, Facebook allowed to create this space of autonomy from state power. After Yanukovych fled Kiev, he went to Kharkiv. On uh, 22nd February, there was a meeting organized by Kernes and then governor Mikhail Odopkin. It's called Ukrainian Front. Yanukovych could come to this meeting and give, uh, and uh, then the conflict and give a speech, and then the conflict in Ukraine would look very different when it, if he claimed his legitimacy. So here is the sport palace where this meeting was taking place, and here is the presidium. You can see some of the most notorious Party of Regions members. So this is Lukyanchenko, mayor of Donetsk, Kernes. Over there, Kalisnichenko, Mogilev, it's fel, uh, f f Prime Minister of Crimea, Dobkin, uh, Tsaryov. So it was inside. And uh, outside, uh, there were these armored vehicles which brought uh, some MPs for, of the Russian uh, Duma, uh, namely Pushkov and Selezhnev. Also, governor of Belgorod came there to support this separatist uh, meeting. Nearby, uh, Kharkiv Euromaidan was protesting. And uh, no one knew what would be happening next. Uh, people, so many people died just the day before in Kiev. But uh, actually this meeting uh, finished abruptly and uh, Kernes and uh, Dobkin fled uh, from the meeting early. And then uh, these supporters, which were brought by buses from uh, Donbass region, also started leaving. And this was the moment of victory of Euromaidan. And uh, then people organized, and uh, yeah, this uh, funny poster reads, Yanukovych is flushed down to golden toilet. <laughs> so people were so happy, and uh, the huge rally moved from here to the city center. Around 35,000 people were marching. You can see how it looked. Really, uh, I remember this feeling. Uh, people were, so many young people thinking that this is over, we won, and yeah, this life will become better just the next day. Here is another picture during the evening. And when the rally arrived to the Central Square, Freedom Square, to the monument of uh, Lenin. They were actually peacefully allowed by one of the vice governors to the uh, regional state administration and peacefully occup occupied it. At some point, the Euromaidan leaders decided to topple the Lenin monument. And actually, it was quite a bad decision, just because it's effectively mobilized uh, all anti-Maidan forces in Kharkiv. So, uh, and uh, uh, first clashes happened late at night when 
the number of Euromaidan supporters reduced. Then uh, fighters from a plot arrived. So there were hundreds of defenders of Lenin. They made a camp around the monument to protect it. And uh, at the same time, numerous calls and demands by uh, anti-Maidan were posted online. I will not go through all the demands. They are quite absurd, especially absurd, the point number five. It uh, uh, reads the, uh, the following. We demand uh, legal protection of the Russian language, at least as their regional language. It's absurd just because uh, the thing is that Russian language was acknowledged as their original language in Kharkiv region in 2006, according to European Charter of Regional Languages. So it already existed, it shouldn't be demanded. It's just because uh, this uh, threat of banning Russian language was multiplied by Russian media and uh, propaganda. And actually, uh, they managed to mobilize anti-Maidan, a lot of people, for the protest on the 1st of March. So, uh, the protest uh, came to fight against imagined fascism. Also, Victor of uh, Euromaidan was uh, represented as sort of occupation of uh, Ukraine by the US. So, this uh, represented themselves as liberators. This is quite a good picture, uh, which actually illustrates this anti-fascist uh, euphoria. Uh, soon this protest uh, turned into violent assault on the regional administration where Euromaidan supporters stayed. Euromaidan activists were inside and were badly beaten and humiliated. Actually, it's a big surprise that no one died, died that day. Among the, those beaten was uh, one of the most prominent contemporary Ukrainian writers, Sergei Zradan. You can see him on this picture taken away, uh, away by police. After administration was captured, uh, one of the protesters has replaced the Ukrainian flag with the Russian one. This protester turned to be from pro-Putin youth organization locals based in Moscow. So, and actually, uh, while uh, Russian uh, uh, commentators from Russian on social media uh, cheered up this move, uh, local Kharkivites, uh, most of them, even those quite skeptical about Euromaidan, were quite uh, upset by this move. So some of the comments, of typical comments, of this event read the, the following. This is just idiotic. Kharkivites have beaten other Kharkivites because of some imagined fascists. Another comment. I never supported Maidan, but this is outrageous. Ukraine is Ukraine. And with such actions, uh, you will start a war. Another comment reads, reads at the following. Who has entitled you to raise uh, the, this flag on behalf of all Kharkivites? Uh, do you want to destroy our country? Uh, put back our, uh, our state flag, pack your stuff and go 100 kilometers north. Ukraine will remain Ukraine without Russia and without you. Actually, the last part of this comment is quite peculiar. Uh, recently, actually two days ago, Renaissance Foundation uh, published uh, the uh, uh, results of survey which was uh, made in Kharkiv in uh, November 2015, uh, uh, just uh, last year. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, pro-EU, pro-Russia integration, the following results were 37% uh, of Kharkivites supported EU integration. 31, this is very, uh, this is a lot, supported uh, customs union integration. But what is interested, interesting, 30% neither supported uh, integration to EU nor to customs union. And the in interviews I've done, this also was quite a uh, uh, usual narrative that why we should integrate somewhere, we should exist as, as a country. So it's quite interesting uh, manifestation of, not very clearly articulated, but manifestation of nationalism, that we shouldn't be uh, dependent of some, some sort of union. These days of uh, uh, violent attacks were full of uncertainty. Observing the occupation of Crimea, no one knew what to expect. 
One widespread rumor was that Kernas, uh, who fled uh, for just two days uh, from Kharkiv and then came back, that uh, he brought from Russia a battalion of Chechens. I heard this story, it was sort of urban legend from ten different people. So, word uh, of a mouth. And uh, such uncertainty kept uh, people worried, as one of experts recalls this period of time. During the, the last spring, I never left uh, home without taking an international passport and some cash with me. As I openly expressed a pro-Ukrainian position on TV, I most definitely would be targeted. The way events were unfolding, it would not uh, be a big surprise to see little grand men on the streets of Kharkiv one morning. Despite real danger and brutality of anti-Maidan mil militants, Euromaidan Kharkiv continued its activities. Here the picture of anti-war march on Taras Shechenko birthday on 9th of March. On 16th of March, uh, another march, uh, these uh, pro-Russian pro uh, protesters uh, went uh, with a huge flag of the Russian Federation. This uh, protest is interested by another uh, fact. During it uh, uh, was filmed Arseny Pavlov, nicknamed Motorola. He later, uh, coming from Rostov, he later became the Russian media hero of Novorossiya, fighting on the side of separatists in Donbass. And uh, he accused in multiple uh, war crimes by Ukraine. Here he is standing, not known by anyone as a usual Titushka. Anti-Maidan uh, tried to reinforce solidarity online. Here is the repost from the page of pseudo-historian and Russian propagandist Nikolai Starikov. So on the one hand, it's a a aimed on showing massive support for, of anti-Maidan. You can see thousands and thousands of followers. On the other, it's the promotion of the Russian new imperial project of Novorossiya, taking south and eastern regions of Ukraine and joining them to Russia. However, anti-Maidan lacked uh, momentum and uh, online creativity, as one of its activists recalls. Anti-Maidan was very uh, badly medialized. Public groups on social media were managed by amateurs and were really bad. There was a very grotesque group called Berkut. By this group, all future events were clear. The community was lost and disoriented. Uh, Anti-Maidan groups on contact were not that bad. The situation has changed dramatically later. Everything institutionalized, new leaders of opinion emerged. It's on uh, closer to the full-scale conflict with uh, Russia. But Anti-Maidan has lost discursively by then. Nonetheless, during the Russian spring, it was capable of mobilizing thousands of people. You can see this panoramic picture of anti-Maidan. But uh, uh, anti-Maidan in uh, Kharkiv was far less numerous than the one in Donetsk. Here is the picture from over there. By April, uh, anti-Maidan, uh, for anti-Maidan, it became clear that they are losing the momentum. So they switched to even more frequent and rough violence. On April the 6th, they caught several Euromaidan supporters, nearly killed them and walked them through so-called corridor of shame. It was a horrible scene. And I actually interviewed brother of one of these guys. And soon after living through this uh, nightmare, he joined one of uh, volunteer battalions. However, the main attack was planned uh, next day, on 7th of April. Actually, it was planned simultaneously assault on regional administrations in Kharkiv, Luhansk, Donetsk, Odessa and other cities. So it was well orchestrated. In Kharkiv, police uh, was demoralized and there was a huge pass, a part of pol a police force uh, who openly sympathized uh, to anti-Maidan. This picture is a good illustration of this. So, uh, however, newly appointed uh, uh, Minister of Interior Arsen Avakov, who by then uh, uh, actually comes also from Kharkiv, made a very wise decision. 
after uh, the uh, original administration was assaulted and uh, uh, by uh, anti-Maidan activists, uh, he uh, sent a special police union Jaguar from Vinnytsia the same night to free the building. Here they are on the picture. And uh, they have freed the building and arrested 68 anti-Maidan ac activists. Actually, they're still uh, awaiting uh, court decisions by now. So for some reason, it's too slow as uh, everything which is happening in terms of reforms and investigations in Ukraine. Beside of rough violence, uh, anti-Maidan used other tactics that was once mentioned by Putin, hiding behind women and children. So here is the call for women to, uh, to uh, come and block courts and police stations where those arrested at the administration uh, buildings uh, were held and trialed. Moreover, uh, anti-Maidan used ridiculous fakes uh, to mobilize its supporters. Here is the video that claims that American dressed as a Ukrainian police special unit uh, Sokol was captured by anti-Maidan supporters in Kharkiv. An American dressed as a Ukrainian policeman. So obviously it's open and quite crazy fake. So in contrast uh, to Donetsk and Lugansk, anti-Maidan and Kharkiv failed to occupy urban space and administrative buildings for a long time. However, it continued uh, violent and attacks on Yevro Maidan. On 13th of April, several people were really badly beaten by these guys. And after the brawl, uh, the protesters went to the city council and demanded Karenis to support separatist referendum. So the situation was really tense at that moment and uh, the council could be occupied as well. Luckily, this uh, never happened. And uh, probably Kernis was quite uh, upset by this socializing with aggressive protesters. After 13th uh, of April, he condemned the election of so-called people mayors and uh, governors and uh, never emerged on anti-Maidan meetings again. In two weeks, he was shot and wounded by a sniper. And uh, he survived uh, this assassination attempt, uh, but uh, he remains in the wheelchair now. We still don't know who is behind the attack, but Anti-Maidan was clearly unhappy with, them, with, with him as well. You may think that uh, with uh, active military actions around Slavyansk in June 2014, Anti-Maidan protests disappeared in Kharkiv. No, it, it wasn't the case. Actually, assemblies near Lenin Monument continued until it was uh, toppled on uh, 28th of September 2014. Uh, here you can see the empty monument. There are two boots of Lenin uh, and in one is of them uh, Ukrainian flag uh, is, is put. So, and uh, uh, some protest mainly with women and uh, pensioners in order to avoid attacks by patriotic uh, and right groups continued and until the events of the, the Baltsova of 2015. So on uh, February, February uh, 22nd of February 2015, another tragedy shook Kharkiv. In order to mark the victory of Euromaidan, activists decided uh, to march from the sports uh, palace to the city center. Just uh, minutes after the march began, a landmine planted at uh, their own site exploded, leaving four people dead, including a 15-year-old boy. Actually, four days ago, uh, a monument uh, near this place was installed by Euromaidan activists in Kharkiv. I left political issues and the election issues aside for purpose, so now I want to discuss uh, them in the context of Kharkiv's identity. So, um, Kharkiv became one of the capitals of volunteer movement and civic initiatives. Such organization as Station Kharkiv helped thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, internally displaced pe uh, people coming from Donbass. Also, uh, there are different fora meetings taking place, different uh, NGOs registered. So, in terms of dynamics, it's really amazing. We'll see the actual uh, later outcomes of this. Euromaidan and Russian Spring consolidated democratic forces. 
Sama Pomic took 10% and third place on parliamentary elections of uh, 2014. It also has factions both in regional and city council. Opposition candidate uh, Alexander Kirsch uh, beat uh, uh, Kernes backed uh, candidate in the city, which is also an amazing result. So we can see the change. However, uh, uh, also during Yanukovych times, uh, uh, several local channels were closed by Kernes, such as ATN, uh, Agency Television News. Uh, they were reopened <coughs> after uh, the victory of Yevro Maidan. Also, great social media news initiatives like IT sector and Kharkiv Life emerged. So, local media now competitive and transparent. Finally, there was a real uh, explosion of patriotic creativity. So, a famous song about Putin uh, was first uh, uh, sent by a Metalist Kharkiv football fans. This is quite you know, a funny poster. It it's, uh, says that these guys from Kharkiv are, are singing a song about me. Also, a, rock ver uh, also, uh, a com new commemorative uh, poppy to replace uh, George Ribbon was proposed by uh, one uh, by Kharkiv artist uh, uh, Serhii uh, Mishakin. And uh, a rock version of the Ukrainian anthem that went viral was played by a musician, musician from Kharkiv, Nikita Rubchenko. Also, several patriotic songs in, in Russian were written by musician, composer and activist uh, Boris Sevastyanov. His hits, uh, This is Baby, Russism, Orthodox, Fascism, uh, has seen nearly 2 million views on uh, YouTube. Well, so can the question how new uh, uh, Kharkiv identity is? Yes, we can. Democratic forces still lack solidarity. They failed to agree uh, candidates uh, during, like one ca candidate from the democratic forces during pa parliamentary election, during uh, local elections. They even failed to propose one uh, candidate uh, to run uh, to fight Kernes. So they are really separated. Also, democratic uh, uh, forces do not separate themselves from far-right groups. I will explain this a bit uh, later. Another big failure, of course, Kernes was re-elected as a mayor last year with astonishing 65.8%. And uh, most of former Party of Regions members were also re-elected, so they form ma majorities in local and regional councils. So, several explanations. Here is Court of Arms of Azov Battalion, Volunteer Battalion. Uh, its founders, uh, um, Bilecki and Staroshenko, they originate from Kharkiv. And uh, this battalion, of course, sparks a lot of controversy. As you can see, this uh, uh, symbols on the back, uh, white one, it's called Black Sun, uh, sort of uh, one of the uh, racist supremacy symbols. Uh, on the front it's uh, Wolf's Hook, it uh, really resembles the uh, symbol of Das Reich division of uh, Nazi Germany. So, I mean, it doesn't bring, uh, doesn't contribute to good, uh, uh, good name of Ukraine internationally, I assume. So, uh, and uh, Azov is quite active and makes uh, a regular torture parade in Kharkiv. And uh, on the, f the, the symbol from candles was made on the central square on 14th October last year, the day of motherland defenders, just 10 days before the local elections. I doubt that it made the uh, uh, citizen, people of Kharkiv more patriotic, but I'm quite sure it contributed to some extra votes to Kernes as protector from imagined or sometimes real fascists. So, um, and um, as I mentioned, Kernes was successfully re-elected. The same uh, for this uh, gentleman standing near Dobkin, his name is Sergei Chernov. So this flash mob during Euromaidan in Kiev was organized by then uh, uh, Mikhail Dobkin as a governor. So all uh, party of regions, uh, uh, <coughs> members of uh, 
regional council came in a t-shirt with Prince Berkut on them. So Chernov is re-elected to regional council and moreover he once again appointed as the chair of the regional council. So after all of this. So there is long way for real change of Kharkiv identity, but uh, the change is taking place. So to sum up, uh, I want to draw some conclusions. In my opinion, prompt and adequate response of the new government was really important for Kharkiv. Uh, if anti-Maidan occupied the regional administration for longer time, it can be easily joined by a little green man, and yeah, situation would went very wrong despite uh, all bravery of Kharkiv Euromaidan activists. Also, uh, what was quite important that there was no uh, open support of separatists by local elites. I, I like, un unlike Donetsk, local e elites never openly recognized people, governors and mayors. As we know, uh, one of uh, aides of Renat Akhmetov uh, 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 has brought uh, then uh, elected uh, governor Gubarev to the regional council. So in this symbolic way he shared the power with self-appointed or people's governor. This never happened in Kharkiv. I think this is very important. Social media was crucial for Euromaidan and anti-Maidan, although Euromaidan utilized it more creatively and effectively. Also, my study highlights the effects of cultural trauma of communism. While anti-Maidan, uh, with its uh, post-Soviet nostalgia, suffers the most, democratic Euromaidan groups also demonstrate lack of solidarity, of unity, in order to bring social change. So there is competition, struggle for power, lack of trust, and it should be changed. Finally, this study argues that anti-Maidan failed to generate strong emotional bonds and uh, luckily to all Ukraine failed to turn Kharkiv into Kharkiv uh, People's Republic. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shenko. Uh, your, uh, your whole picture of uh, Kharkiv uh, very well, uh, but uh, I'm sure there are uh, uh, questions and comments and challenges uh, and uh, points on which people would like to uh, uh, hear some elaboration. So the floor is open to uh, questions. Yaris. Could you comment about the media situation, television media, Russian channels in Kharkiv, the amount of Russian news that goes into Kharkiv over this period of time and what the situation is now. Have they closed down Russian television outlets or? Uh, actually, uh, during uh, the uh, spring months, uh, there was the whole bunch of Russian reporters staying in Kharkiv and really distorting the picture is what's going on. Uh, there is a uh, uh, news reporter uh, was based in Kharkiv uh, until actually late April when she was deported by SBU. And uh, for uh, uh, central TV channels, uh, the broadcasting was prohibited at the same time by central U Ukrainian government. I rem uh, as I remember, it was like March. But uh, all uh, uh, anti-Maidan supporters, they told me that actually they continue to watch uh, f uh, Russian television from the internet. So I mean, we live in the digital age and uh, to ban television, uh, it's quite complicated. Although there is digital divide, you have to be acknowledged with the technology. And maybe those uh, pensioners and uh, other anti-Maidan uh, sympathizers can be deprived of television, uh, which was switched off uh, in I think in, in mid March. Yeah. To what extent uh, do Western electronic media uh, uh, penetrate Kharkiv? BBC, Deutsche Welle, CNN Europe? Uh, I don't think much. No, no not really. Okay. It's, uh, this is maybe so called creative class might be interested in these sources of information. Or people who uh, use Facebook, they uh, may 
come across these sources, so they are mainly internet related, and uh, that's why. But there should be quite um, quite developed taste for sources of information to look for for these sources. I think uh, the main source is uh, Ukrainian television that actually quite unfortunately took the battle uh, with Russian propaganda quite literally. So they decided that they have to produce just the same old propaganda and uh, just saying something opposite. So uh, I have to acknowledge that yeah, some Ukrainian channel, channels came with very biased coverage of events, which I don't really contribute to the establishment of trust. Um, you had a, you had your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Um, when the uh, violence started, especially against some of the Euromaidan uh, people, um, and uh, you showed these uh, scenes where um, they were uh, um, humiliated and beaten up and, and had to, um, I guess, uh, crawl through these corridors of shame. To me, that was a uh, you know, shocking, of course, but uh, how did that affect uh, the ordinary Kharkiv, uh, a Kharkiv uh, person who maybe was not politically engaged? But when was this was this widely known in Kharkiv? Was this shown on television in Kharkiv as well? These scenes of uh, you know um, the humiliation of these people. Uh, how was it discussed? You know, in the media. Uh, actually, what is uh, yeah? It's an important question. Uh, it was uh, quite well covered, and uh, yeah, these were really ugly scenes, and uh, most of, at least of my immediate uh, circle, were really shocked. One interviewer who was uh, an anti-Maidan supporter withdrawn from protest after this first assault on the regional administration. So they were maybe nostalgic for the Soviet times, but they were not prepared for these uh, levels of uh, violence, which were de delivered straight away, uh, as now we know also with some help, uh, with uh, some helpers across the border. Uh, th they found uh, very decent coverage. Also, uh, YouTube videos were quite crucial for dissemination of information. Not only dissemination. Actually, this uh, uh, on 13th of um, April, when one uh, Euromaidan activist, actually PhD from Kharkiv uh, uh, University, uh, and then the lecturer was badly beaten, had his uh, skull fractured, and it happened in uh, uh, near University Underground Station. And uh, there was one woman who came and kicked him, and it was caught on camera, and it caused outrage. And this woman was uh, identified. Uh, she was actually a nurse from a small uh, town from Kharkiv region. And uh, she, she was convicted for two years, I think. So she was uh, identified only due that this episode was filmed and widely disseminated. Unfortunately, most of the attackers are not still not caught and uh, this is quite uh, disappointing but I mean in terms of uh, dissemination of this shocking material yes there were plenty of them and uh, while one part of uh, of anti-Maidan sympathizers were demobilized by this others were even encouraged you know if you call people fascist the next step you make you beat or kill them. So this uh, most definitely anti-Maidan was uh, driven by by really high levels of hate and violence and aggression. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much Ivan for a very interesting and vivid and visual talk. Um, I'm interested in your field work. So you mentioned that you interviewed people from two <coughs> sides to supporters of anti-Maidan and supporters of Maidan. So I wonder, how did you choose those people? Did you, uh, were those your friends, or did you contact them through social media? Were they willing to give you an interview? Were they suspicious of your intentions? If you could please elaborate on that. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, actually, I did snowballing, and you know, uh, been uh, uh, 
come, been raised uh, in, in Kharkiv, it's uh, helped a lot. So snowballing technique when you uh, find someone who may hold, say, anti-Maidan views, and then you ask about his friends, do you know like active participants of events? And then uh, you meet these people, you provide assurances of research ethics, so they agree to be interviewed on the condition of anonymity and confidentiality. And yes, you can get some very valuable information. On one occasion, I managed actually to recruit uh, one guy for an interview from online. But generally, uh, all uh, queries uh, online, they never found response or just found uh, root or, or just swearing in response. So people were very suspicious at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, two or three brief questions. One, um, would it be fair to say that uh, the demoralization of the police and the Secret Service and the city authorities in Kharkiv was less than in Luhansk and Donetsk? In other words, do you have the impression that it was m more poorly prepared? So that's the first question. And along, along these lines, I'm wondering about... Uh, these students, I, I've seen the, the river of students, it's an amazing number of students in the city of Kharkiv, and uh, I'm wondering if you'd comment a little bit about how they behaved in all of this uh, as a social, social formation. And then finally, on the news today we see that Karen's best friend, his business partner, was uh, killed at his mother's grave, and Karen's went to the spot and so on. How, how do you understand that assassination? Thank you for this uh, questions. Um, in terms of police, actually Kharkiv has uh, the image uh, not only as the city of students but as the city of police. <laughs> Just because there is a big police academy and also there is a law academy. So it always, it never was sort of gangster city when, during 1990s. So police was all, always quite strong. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's actually maybe allowed to rebuild this control of uh, central authorities quite quickly when Avakov became, uh, became a, a, a minister of interior. And especially he was a governor uh, during Yushchenko times. So he knew which people to appoint, and these people arrived with ready kind of trusted people. So uh, I think it's, it definitely contributed to, uh, to establishing control. And uh, maybe even those uh, police officers, sympathizers, they still ha had to obey. Well, as in Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, there were like uh, very high ranks of police controlled by uh, by local oligarchs and uh, oligarchs maybe they openly never uh, supported separatism but uh, there are numerous claims say about Yefremov who ordered the strikes who ordered to announce this uh, additional tax to rebuild Maidan uh, imposed on miners of course this war was uh, artificially this tension and outrage was created in Donbass and uh, I think in these terms uh, Kharkiv was definitely in better position than uh, Lohansk and uh, Donetsk. Although I think there were several with this uh, several right decisions, you know, everything could go wrong and these police officers, yeah, then if the uh, anti-Maidan would get the momentum, I think they would, uh, there is a probability that they would betray the same as happened in Donetsk. And uh, there are footages how they, they uh, taking the commands of uh, people from nowhere, from sub separatists. In terms of students, actually students were really passive all, 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 all over the course of uh, Euromaidan. So as uh, several uh, Euromaidan coordinators noted that we had very adult uh, Euromaidan. So there were plenty of people, and I've seen this with my own eyes, uh, like uh, professors, like uh, uh, local intelligence. The situation somewhat changed uh, when uh, football uh, fans of uh, Metalist Kharkiv decided to protect Euromaidan. 
So since then you can see, uh, uh, since mid-January, there were quite a lot of uh, young people in Balaclava standing around, like protecting the Euro Maidan. But uh, this uh, March on 22nd, yeah, this was amazing. Probably in logic of students, <coughs> they saw no point to stand in at the Euro Maidan, and of course it was periphery in comparison with Kyiv. So they see no point in coming on the daily basis or coming to the Vichy on Sunday. But uh, everyone realized the importance of moment on 22nd. So that's why this huge turnout by students was amazing. And, uh, and during the Russian Spring, actually, there were quite a lot of young people participating as well. So they were more active, actually, during the Russian Spring, during this uh, really struggle against uh, anti-Maidan than during Euro-Maidan. As well with uh, this uh, developments with Kermis, it's complicated to say uh, what, what what is happening. You know, uh, neither of these uh, big investigations uh, are, uh, are finished, so we never know who is behind. Uh, Kermis himself actually accuses Avakov uh, for this assassination attempt. So. Uh, we may see against the accusation that this assassination was arranged by someone from the new Ukrainian government. And uh, people surrounding uh, Kermis, yeah, uh, some of them have criminal records. So these are like businessmen of 1990s. Many of them uh, come from organized crime like Kermis himself. So it's quite complicated. See, to say what is actually happening. Professor Philippine? Uh, I want to go back to Jiri mm -hmm. and to the question of violence, especially the very violent attack on the Maidan, pro Maidan forces by the anti Maidan forces. I might lack the vocabulary to express what I'm trying to find out, but basically, what I have been detecting is a pattern of racism and bigotry. It has not been well documented. It almost looks like Ukrainians don't notice what is going on. Zhilin uh, gave an interview very early on during the revolution. Unfortunately, I don't remember the, the publication, but it, I've said that I can find it, where he talks about the need to attack Ukrainians because they're a lower form of life. His vocabulary is very similar to the vocabulary of Dugin, where he talks about Ukrainians as vermin. And, um, and in that particular interview, he talks about that it is okay to break legs or bones or to attack, he says, don't kill because apparently the laws don't permit you to kill, but he permits his own group to engage in extremely violent acts. I see this part as a bigger picture, a picture that still needs to be studied. I encountered this in the vocabulary of fellow Slavists who look at Russian culture as something superior to Ukrainian. The, uh, uh, the foreign, the, uh, uh, the representative of Russia to the United, uh, no, oh, the big diplomat for Russia. Uh, he even has a poem in the, uh, soon after uh, Gorbachev gets the, um, the peace prize, where he talks about the um, second-class nationalities or ethnicities. In other words, it's a culture which accepts that there are higher forms of life and lower forms of life. And I'm wondering whether you have detected any of this in the interviews that you took with your anti-Maidan people. Does that in any way come? Uh, come through. Yeah. 
thank you for the question. Yeah, I also remember this uh, ridiculous interview by Julian. Uh, he, he was saying that if I'm in the mode of preventing crime, I can break legs and uh, hands and I, it won't be a crime on my side, which is ridiculous. He's a former policeman himself. And uh, yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's crazy to say this. And uh, a plot was really ideological. And is very ideological. Actually, I, I was thinking about bringing the codes of arms into presentation, but then at the last moment removed the slide. Actually, they represent the globe on the side where the with red is marked the territory of the Soviet Union, and on the front there is Reno. So uh, these two symbols, you know, Reno symbolizes. Uh, it actually symbolizes um, this idea of Dugin's Eurasianism sort of Eurasia as land empire, as opposing to the sea empire of Anglo-Saxons. It's, uh, it's uh, even the code of arms, it's representing this uh, neo-fascist uh, Dugin's theory of uh, racist, uh, ra racial su superiority. And uh, our plot is based on this like bricolage and really postmodern mixture of Soviet narratives and openly racist narratives. In terms of Euromaidan supporters, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually very bizarre that while declaring fighting fascism, they are openly racist. If to see what was said, uh, uh, what, what was addressed uh, to, uh, to the president of the US, Obama, it's ridiculous racist bigotry. And uh, the same for Ukrainians, so you really can, uh, can hear a lot of this. So. Um, I, I think about this as reconfigured uh, Soviet heritage, just because uh, on discursive level in Soviet uh, Union, all ethnicities were equal and recognized as equal. But in practical terms, uh, there was like a titular uh, uh, in a, in a ethnic republics there was appointed someone of titular uh, ethnicity. And he, he was, he was uh, al always um, sort of ruled by the first deputy who was always either Russian or Ukrainian. So in, in practical terms uh, there was of course uh, uh, a, a discrimination based on ethnicity. But it's all only till now when this uh, uh, Soviet myth became reconceptualized and reimagined these uh, motives of racism uh, emerge quite openly. There is quite a distinct group of uh, anti-Maidan supporters who are neo-paganists. So they use this, you know, like call of rat, this Slavic swastikas. And they uh, propagate uh, racial superiority and so on. Which is quite bizar bizarre. So like racists pretending to be fighting some imagined Nazis, and all Ukrainians are labeled as, as Nazis, uh, at least for now. It's also uh, interesting how discourse about Ukrainians was changing in uh, anti-Maidan groups. So it started from defining Halicia as some sort of non-Slavic even people, like uh, not our people, whereas the rest of Ukrainians are our people who have been occupied by Hunt. But uh, over the course of this like uh, two years, the discourse shifted completely. So in anti-Maidan groups, all Ukrainians are now labeled <coughs> as fascists. So this is a huge uh, change. So probably it's also and uh, yeah, in terms of uh, language, yeah, it's hate language and uh, hate speech uh, and uh, open racism is quite widely practiced. Yeah, I just remember the name Lavrov. He's the one who wrote that book. And what is interesting is that in the Slavic and Eastern Islam, uh, the Sinai uh, discussion list, most of my Slavic colleagues defended that line on the premise that he's a poor poet, so we shouldn't take it seriously. But the, the idea that there are inferior ethnicities was not questioned by a single Russianist. And this is where I see. I see a bigger problem. Uh, I also see a bigger problem internally is that many Ukrainians have absorbed this uh, colonial hatred of the self. 
It's the strama, drama of colonialism. And you see this in the Haki <coughs> women's group, Zhiryopkin uh, and Company. I don't know if you're acquainted with their writings, but I find them very bigoted. Yeah, I agree. Long, long way ahead. It's lots of work should be done in terms of understanding and dealing with this uh, problem, symbolic problem, and problems of self-understanding. Sure, Paul. Well, you briefly mentioned sort of uh, orthodoxy as an ideology for anti-Maidan. Um, in your discussions and in your studies of the anti-Maidan, do they make much use of religion? And did the Orthodox Church um, play any role at all in the confrontation between Maidan and, and uh, anti-Maidan? Thank you for the question. Yes, it does. Actually, when uh, at the beginning of the Russian Spring, uh, Patriarch uh, Kirill Gundyaev openly called for mobilization. And, uh, yeah, there are reports uh, by different uh, priests uh, of uh, Russian uh, Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate, uh, which uh, make quite controversial statements. Uh, I mean, in uh, in Ukraine, uh, the situation is quite tense. Uh, say, uh, the local metropolitan uh, Anufi he uh, doesn't recognize uh, the Russian aggression, so he says about uh, internal divides in Ukraine. So supports the narrative of this civil war. Uh, when uh, when uh, in uh, Verkhovna Rada uh, we were honored uh, having the hundreds by standing up with the minute of silence, uh, the priests of the Russian Orthodox Church said, just ignored this openly. So this uh, obviously shows that they take taking sides. In terms of uh, online discussions, it's quite rare. There is appeal to uh, Orthodox people, so it's, you know, with the common goals, so our people, Slavic people, Orthodox people. But in terms of more deeper uh, explanation and articulation, it's quite complicated to trace. So I think this identity is quite shallow, but uh, they are sort of assembled of this uh, big collective identity of anti-Maidan or Russian world. But uh, instrumentally, actually the Russian world, it's uh, the concept which was introduced by Kirill, I think, in 2007, when uh, he was given a speech about uh, the uh, Russian world and orthodoxy as a, as a foundation of the Russian world. And uh, of course, uh, it may be mentioned before, but in the discourse it was um, much more discussed after he mentioned it. So they are interrelated, but in terms of depth, it may be found, but uh, in my study I cannot provide any further particulars. Thank you. Yes, please. You had uh, touched on just briefly uh, people that have been fleeing from the south, coming into Kharkiv, Kharkivshina. What, uh, how many are there, do you know? And do you expect, what kind of impact do you expect they would have on Kharkiv? Thank you for the question. Uh, actually, estimates, uh, I, I may be wrong, it's around 300,000 relocated to Kharkiv. And uh, uh, Kharkiv shares, uh, so the most, uh, uh, the highest number of interior dis internally displaced people is uh, the Luhansk and Donetsk region themselves. So people basically live in the war zone. If to go further, I think Kiev first place, Kharkiv is second place. So it's, it's, there are really a lot of people from uh, Luhansk and Donetsk moving. And you can see this with uh, license plates of cars. So everyone who could leave the war zone, zone did so. So you, you can see this uh, expensive, sometimes very expensive cars in the streets of Kharkiv. So uh, it's um, complicated to say the about uh, political impacts. I know that uh, there were very big different uh, difficulties, and actually I think it was uh, made partly for 
political purposes for these people to vote, to register and vote. So that's why like opposition bloc accuses uh, a new Ukrainian authorities of depriving people from vote. So that's why getting high results in the elections. And I think this is the case. Uh, but other than this, uh, they uh, uh, represent uh, like invisible minority. You cannot see uh, them. It's the same fellow Ukrainians, not recognizable in anywhere. So, and uh, and uh, there are some studies which are targeting internally displaced uh, people specifically. I think they generate more uh, more nuanced information about them. I I don't possess that much information. Yours? What is the current situation on the Russian-Ukrainian border near Kharkiv? The movement of traffic, is it, you know, long lineups, is there uh, tension, is there, what's, uh, you know, what's the mood like on the border, because it's very close. Uh, actually, there is obviously a big, uh, the, the number of goods, uh, like, dropped dramatically. I, I mean, vir virtually the exchange was very high, and uh, now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's low. Also, before Euromaidan, there was huge numbers of uh, people from Belgrade who came to Kharkiv, just because big, uh, nice city, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, high salaries, they they were they possessed more buying power. So there were a lot of people coming for the weekend to Kharkiv from Belgrade. Of course, it's not happening now. Uh, Kharkiv activists joined this blockade of uh, Russian lorries. So in Goptovka, uh, the, this uh, uh, border crossing points, they blockaded several uh, lorries. Then they tried to, uh, to make this official and they tried to come to speak to uh, Kharkiv governor, uh, 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 Igor Reinin. And uh, the reaction was quite uh, kind of, he overreacted. They sent like police with shields to block the entrance to administration which looked quite Yanukovych style, if to be honest, as a response to this uh, uh, local activists. Um, sometimes uh, they report uh, that uh, there are like obstacles made by Russian side, then yeah, there are long queues. But uh, since the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, uh, I mean, traffic fall down dramatically. So it's, it's not that much move, 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 movement to be blocked and to be invisible. If I may, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, uh, I didn't quite uh, get the point you were driving at in terms of, uh, or your conclusion in terms of identity. Uh, what proportion of Kharkivites regard themselves as Ukrainian and which proportion as Russians? And in your uh, interview subjects, was there? <coughs> did you did you find that distinction and so on? And how does that how is that tied in with the uh, results of this con uh, uh, confrontation between the Euromaidan and the anti-Maidan? Anti-Maidan. Thank you for this question. Yeah, I touched these questions, and uh, all the supporters of Euromaidan uh, define themselves as Ukrainian. So. Uh, even though uh, those who were of uh, Russian background, I mean, this is uh, really quite clearly a civic identity. In terms of uh, uh, anti-Maidan, it's more nuanced. Some were defining themselves as Ukrainians, but some define themselves as, uh, as uh, just Slavs. And uh, this is quite interesting, uh, this uh, supranational identity, sort of pan slavic identity. Well, as having like a uh, Ukrainian name, uh, surname. So this is a uh, really uh, non-acceptance of current Ukrainian national project and uh, uh, like uh, attempt in terms of self-understanding to distance themselves uh, from Ukraine. And uh, uh, some of those interviewed actually switched to Ukraine with the, the event, uh, while as they never spoke Ukrainian before, so it was a rational choice. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, despite the fact that Euromaidan obviously uh, manifests a lot of, of civic identity, it was an interesting moment in Kharkiv Euromaidan. There was an open microphone, so people could share their thoughts, and uh, most of uh, those who spoke uh, Russian before they switched to Russian, they were apologizing not for not uh, being able to speak Ukrainian properly. So despite this uh, sort of civic uh, European project, there are still traits of understanding of importance of ethnic uh, Ukrainian identity. So it was really noticeable. And yeah, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, any other questions? No other questions? Yes, I a comment. Uh, yes, there, was a, there was a very interesting um, uh, news, uh, I guess, story or document, or you know, short documentary on a CBC journalist who yeah. lived in Kharkiv um, up through the uh, 1970s, and he's of uh, uh, he's a Ukrainian Jew who uh, emigrated as a young boy to Canada, and now he's a CBC journalist, and he went back to Kharkiv to, to visit with his old classmates. He's in his, I guess, late 50s, early 60s, and his classmates are the same age. And what was interesting to me anyway, was, was, was that his, um, some of his classmates uh, reflected on how the events had changed them, and one of them said, you know, that I never used to pay attention to the national anthem before, but now when the national anthem is played, I, I, I get goosebumps, or I get, you know, I, I get chills, you know, I feel very proud, you know, so, something along those lines. So um, if you have a chance, maybe uh, you could uh, take a look at this. Uh, I, I think it would be available, it's still available online, but it's interesting because it's a fellow who lived in Kharkiv and doesn't really have any connections any longer, but he went to visit his old classmates and they, and they, and they talk about how these events, um, you know, um, how they saw these events and the way they interpret them and how it affected them. Thank you very much for this suggestion. And uh, some of those are on uh, the other side as well, yes. some of his classmates. Yeah, some of his classmates are skeptical or, you know... I've seen that's our special at CBC. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yes, please. When you're uh, answering or replying to yours uh, question, I, I wasn't clear. I wanted to know, if, or do you know if the border crossing on Kharkiv, the control points, is it free-flowing like the Natsk Luhansk? Or is it well controlled where Ruska no može parete kordon? Do you know or? Uh, it's quite, uh, I mean like theoretically uh, Russians can cross border anywhere if they invade. But uh, as to, in terms of controlled uh, border, of course it's fully controlled by, uh, by Ukrainian uh, border, by Ukrainian government. Why shouldn't it be? I mean, there are we are hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of young people stopped at this border during the Russian spring. So, and uh, at some point, yeah, all uh, young males or even all males from the Russian Federation were banned from entering Ukraine, just because there were too many of these uh, like uh, Motorola types coming. And uh, there are still reports that. Uh, uh, people with huge uh, some amounts of money are held on the border, so and they are thought to come, to go and to pay to separatist uh, uh, militants. So, or some people held with uh, propaganda, uh, DNA and LNR self-proclaimed sim symbols and so on. Some are held <coughs> with um, some military ammunition. So obviously they are going to join. Uh, separatist. So uh, a lot of uh, things are going on on, on the border, but uh, in, in in my opinion, it's uh, fully and well operational by by uh, Ukrainian border guards. Well, there are, uh, yes, one more question. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you uh, were thinking in uh, in terms of 
what happened in Odessa, whether there's any similarity there to what happened in Ar Kharkiv, I'm just wondering. Yeah, very good question. Actually, events in Kharkiv explain uh, this tragedy in Odessa on the 2nd of May quite well. So, three days before the tragedy in Odessa, uh, uh, Kharkiv Metalist uh, fans had a huge march from the city center to the stadium. Uh, f uh, and uh, they, there was a provocation by anti-Maidan activists. So they basically approached the column and uh, made a provocation. Then the fans attacked them. Several people were beaten not that bad badly and one car was damaged. No one was killed. So there was a clash, but uh, obviously there was no attempt to kill anyone. Then these fans went uh, to this game of Chernomorets and Metalists in Odessa on the 2nd of May, and they were standing in the uh, square then approached by pro-Russian militants. There was massive provocation. The first person to die was actually a football fan. It shows that uh, there was no pur purpose to uh, burn these uh, people in this uh, uh, building. It's just uh, very uh, bad luck that this, is, uh, this happened. Fans themselves uh, in previous elections <coughs> showed that they had no purpose of killing people and uh, they were not going for provocations. And uh, I'm, I'm wonder why these uh, two events never put together, just because they show that the same people uh, in Kharkiv went to Odessa joined by s same fans and uh, then there was a massive provocation by activists from Kulikova Pole from anti-Maidan Odessa. And of course it's, it's a huge tragedy that so many people died. But it hardly can be seen as intentional considering previous uh, es escalations of violence uh, with the part of football fans. Well, on your uh, behalf I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Kozachenko, for your uh, presentation. And, uh, Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending, of course. Um, and just before we adjourn, 